And now I'd like to introduce Dr. Dee Rashong, who is the founding member of this symposium. Dee? Thank you, Susan. Each year, Margaret, Judy, and I set aside a day to discuss the lessons of our lives, and there are many, uh, during the past year in preparation for choosing our symposium topic and speaker. And these, by the way, if you knew us very well, are very autobiographical, and uh, you'd have to know me pretty well to know the entire story. Uh, and we bring along with us our favorite books, uh, as well as our ideas for personal growth that we've worked on for ourselves during the year. And this year, we were drawn to the work of Marcia Sinatar again. And to our delight, she accepted our invitation to be with us. I look forward to spending the day with Marcia Sinatar. For some time now, when I've been called upon to give a speech or a workshop on psychological growth, I look first to the work of Marcia Sinatar. You probably don't know that. I find therein the impetus to connect with my own best self. And often I find a phrase or a concept which gives me inspiration I seek to begin my own work. Her writing is truly a gift, not only to herself, but to all of us who choose to spend time studying her work. Dr. Sintar is not only a noted author, but she's an educator, and, and as I talk with her, I realize that she's a teacher of the highest order. She's also a pen and ink illustrator and an organizational psychologist. She's been immersed in the study of creatively gifted, self-actualizing adults for over three decades. Her books are used worldwide in university classrooms, career counseling, therapeutic sessions, spiritual direction groups, and corporate human resource programs. That's a very wide range of uh, the helping profession to appeal to. Perhaps no other contemporary author speaks as simply and compellingly about tops, topics like adult creativity, self-esteem, right livelihood, and self-actualization. She currently heads Sinatar and Associates, a Santa Rosa-based human resource advisory firm, and has since 1980, when she, as I know her, uh, probably in a very planful way, took a flying leap out of public education into this field and she began at that point I think to build the life that she indeed wanted and I certainly admire her for that. She's the author of the best-selling book Do What You Love The Money Will Follow, Elegant Choices Healing Choices, Living Happily Ever After, Developing a 20th century mind, 21st Century Mind, and To Build the Life You Want Create the Work You Love. Her work has begun to win awards and most recently, she won the Body, Mind, and Spirit Award of Excellence and the Catholic Press Association Award, Award for her pen and ink drawings. So she does a variety of things well. We're very fortunate today to have Marcia with us. Uh, I was fortunate last night, I had dinner with Marcia, and she told me that she doesn't do this often and that this is really a rare appearance. And I asked her uh, why we were chosen to be with her today. And she said that we are people who value the teaching. And when she talks about the teaching, uh, it's not as if, you know, she's very humble. And uh, as, as you read her books, you realize that, that Marcia knows that God speaks through her. And so she calls it the teaching rather than her teaching. I admire her for that. Marcia lives amongst the coastal redwoods in Northern California as quietly and as simply as possible. We welcome Dr. Marcia Sinatar. Well, I hardly know what to say. Thank you so, so much. I had planned to tell you a little bit about myself, but now I see I don't have to. <laughs> Um, I am honored to be with you and I want to thank each and every one of you for giving up such a beautiful Saturday to be here and I hope to do justice to your time and I really do appreciate it and I do want to say just to add a word to what Dr. Rashong was saying that um, they have to get me out of my house now with a crowbar 
<laughs> I'm so busy and so happy in the work that I'm doing and the life that I have that really, um, like all of you, it takes a lot of discernment to know, is this something that I need to do, want to do? Um, will it add value to me and to the other? And as I think about the opportunities to go out and speak, and they are multiple these days, um, what I like to do is spend time with old friends or people that I've met before or people that I think are going to use the work in some way to further their fulfillment, their creative creativity and that of others. So there's a cascading effect here. Uh, it's one thing to appear on TV with an 800 number, one of my pet peeves these days, and sort of inundate the uh, minds of people with simplistic formulas. It's another thing to invest our time, and all of you know what I'm speaking about, in a way where our lives are deepened and enriched through our contacts with other people, real relationship with other people. So as I talk with you today, um, one of the things I hope that will happen, um, I won't be shy with you to go back to what Dr. Rashang was saying, and you don't be shy with me. And we'll have a time, now let me get this set up. I understand this is a sensitive mic, and so I don't have to talk too loudly. Um, one of the things that we'll do is we'll work in a kind of a round robin fashion. So I've divided the day up into three parts and let me just turn to the uh, board here for those of you that like to take notes of how something is going and because I get off the topic and meander uh, this is about as structured as it's going to get <laughs> but um, the first part would be to ask the question of all of us and I will talk more in the first part than in the other parts would be to, to talk about what's possible in my field. And by my field, it could be the field that you're in now, or it could be the field that you hope to enter. And that I would leave up to you. But what I thought I would do as my task in this first portion is to talk a little bit about what are the uh, macro trends happening in business today to excite you about the possibilities for your future. This is the most marvelous time to be alive. Maybe every time is a marvelous time to be alive. But this, we are in the midst and on the threshold of such an exciting change, change of learning, change of roles, long living, healthy living, that despite the problems that we hear about every day incessantly on the radio and TV and newspapers, we don't realize enough, and I'm as guilty as anyone, I think, how marvelous the opportunities are. So I, I want to spend a little bit of time this morning just saying, you know, what's possible? And truly, almost anything is possible today. If we have our intention and our focus and our strategies in place, almost anything is possible. So that's number one. The second thing I would like to do is to have a time where we have a question, let's call it a visioning question, and it would be what's possible for me? In other words, for you. So first we want to do the context, and secondly we want to say what's possible for me? Kind of looking out to your future. You know, um, Dr. Roshang was saying a little bit about my background, that I came out of public sector work, I left the public sector and went into the private sector about uh, 1980. I had started planning it, yes I did. Um, but finally one day, out of character, I'd had it. And I, I was in a curriculum consulting administrative role in the public school system in Torrance, California, if anybody knows Torrance. Wonderful school district. And uh, my original uh, intent was to be a superintendent of schools. But I knew I was going to have to wait long, 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 long time before they gave me that break. And um, so one day, it, having it up to here, and ha my little plan was rolling out, and I thought, 
oh why not i went across the street and said this is it i quit and so um <laughs> My original um, professional launch, so to speak, was with primary children. And primary children, and I'm going to tell you a few stories about myself as I go along. Primary children are the most wonderful optimists as far as what is possible. And you cannot be around them if you love children without picking up a little bit of that optimism. And then I began to work with in the corporate sector, and I've worked with all ages in the corporate sector and all kinds of people, from uh, people who are in technical positions like research and development fields uh, to the heads of companies. And about 1992, and I'm giving you this background for a reason, uh, in about 1992 I was privileged to be invited to join a strategy team, that's pretty much what I do now. It's the human, uh, human resources, but it's really more strategic than personnel oriented. A uh, strategy team of multinational investors who is building a l life care center, a, a prototypical life care center, and they're going to build these around the world. And so what we have are multiple types of people from different countries coming together and our focus groups typically uh, include people who are in their 80s and their 90s. And I mention this so that you will have some confidence in what you're going to hear. And that's why I call it the teaching. It's really principles about living well and robustly, which doesn't mean pain free, by the way, you know, following your bliss can be pretty bumpy. <laughs> it's not just, oh, tra-la, you know. It, it's a struggle to be a human, a real human being. And all you have to do is look at the scriptures of the world, all the world, and you see that the great prophets of all different countries struggle to be whole and decent and integrated people and to be courageous. So when I'm speaking to you, going back to my original point, I want you to understand that I'm coming from a place of someone that has worked in the practical application of certain principles with very, very young children, teachers, parents, corporate heads of companies, and also with individuals who are uh, now going into a retirement which they don't which they have told us they do not like the word retirement as one of the first things we're going to do is redefine that word and many of you out there I see some gray hair I've got my own gray hair now and um, you might not see it from back there but I sure see it every day and it doesn't matter because one of the things that's true is that a person that has that sort of robust healthy self-worth or self-respect or self-trust is someone that is going to create a life that they love and do work that is fulfilling so that they serve themselves and other people. All of that to say, as I move into my uh, remarks, and as I said, let, give me a little bit of time where I just kind of introduce myself to you in this way. Um, M much of my work is autobiographical. It doesn't seem that way, but it really is. And it is because I don't have a business background. And I did not have certain advantages. Uh, put myself through school, I have a long story, I'm not gonna bore you with it, but really uh, the will to succeed that burned in my heart is burning in your hearts. And it never stops if we're lucky. It never, that little fire or flame or spirit or spark of genius, as Warren Bennis calls it, it never goes out. And um, so the books really have been a, a sort of question, what's possible? And that's why I list my questions the way I do. So how we'll work today is I'll give a little bit of a lecture, kind of a lecturette, we can call it, about one of these um, topics and um, stimulate your thinking and then I'll give you a journal exercise and then we'll do some interactive activity whatever it might be um, 
I have a few in my hip pocket, but I usually wait to read the audience before I pull them out. And um, uh, they're interactive. And I would also say that we'll have a we'll have what's called a, what I call a dialogue session after each of these key areas. So we have an opportunity to talk to each other. And there are some microphones I see. This is a luxury, I must say. Uh, usually people are screaming from the back and I'm forgetting to repeat the question. So there's one microphone over there and there's another one over here. And those of you that have loud booming voices and don't need them, that's fine too. So the purpose today, then uh, looking at what uh, has been said thus far is really to explore how to build the life that you want, your values, your talents. I looked up in the brochure and that was really what was stated there that would be discussed. How we incorporate our talents, our values, our desire for growth. And by the way, those three elements, talent, values, desire for growth, healthy growth, are the, are the it's like gas, it's like super octane. If you can tap into your talents, your values, and your desire for healthy growth all of your life, that's the octane you want to put in the tank of your psyche because it will rev you up and give you courage as it did me and as it has done for many, many people that I know. So, um, really what we're talking about with this purpose, as I see it, is the development of a mind shift, a mind shift. And we're moving from that 20th century mind, which I'm going to speak about as we move along today, to a 21st century mind. It is totally different, it is different. And I promise, or at least I will try, not to use the word paradigm uh, in my talk to you. I'm not really sure what it is. But I will say that my books presuppose a basic entry-level health, entry-level health. The things I write about, and keep in mind who my audience has been all through my life in this research, are individuals who are functioning, okay? So the dysfunctioning portion needs to enter into our discussion at some point. But if we're going to build a life that we want and do work that we love, it presupposes, I'm going to say this again, it presupposes a certain energy level, a certain ability to get places on time, to keep appointments, to keep agreements, to be articulate about the things that we want, all of that. So there's homework to be done all the time. And when we're sad and depressed and so on, as everybody does get sometimes, as I said earlier, that's the time to turn to uh, an adult education course, a therapist, a career counselor, a spiritual director, a college professor, a guidance counselor, you name it. Some trusted other with whom we can have a dialogue about the serious big issues of our life. You see, and, it and it's lifelong, so one needs to kind of check in occasionally. That's, that's how I wanted to set up my background for you so you'll understand the dynamic nature of this change that we're involved in. It's not only that we're involved in a universal dynamism, countries coming together, technology and so forth and so on, but we're also involved in our own dynamic if we're healthy. And that inner dynamic is changing all the time, growing all the time, reaching out for different ways of expression all the time. So let me start with this story, and it's this little story about, yes, primary children. It has to do with a longitudinal study that was done some time ago, and it was reported on CNN, and that's where I picked it up. It, it went this way, that the researchers took a group of kindergarten students some time ago, 20, 30, 40 years ago, and they tried to do what uh, Terman did with the uh, IQ, following high IQ individuals. But here they were looking for creative genius, and they thought that they would find a small percent of the class, the, of this kindergarten class, that were creative geniuses, which um, the way uh, I define it, and 
I did not hear CNN define it, but I would say it's the ability to invent novel solutions and spot answers and be inventive and like that um, in a particular area, if not all areas. So the researchers thought that they would find a small percentage and uh, they had planned to track this class through school and into adulthood in the same area of creativity. And to their amazement, they found the bulk of the class, nearly 90% of the class, they would characterize as creative geniuses. And then they went back, and they were shocked because they didn't expect it. And then they went to the same group of students in adolescence. Uh, they were just about ready to go into middle school. And they found that nearly half of the creative genius category had dropped away. It was the same group of students, but now about 40% was what they would characterize as creative, having creative genius. And then after college, uh, somewhere in the first two years of uh, work, they went to the same group of people and they tested them. And of course here we come to the same standards that we see in the general population. They found about 10% had what they call creative genius. So I start this way because I want to say to you and to myself that we all have in us an artist, capital A, a creative genius, that if not inventive in the sense of Galileo or uh, Bill Gates or whatever, is capable of solving the problems of our particular life. So our particular life is unique, your life and my life. They are not the same. You know, Mother Teresa always says that she can do something we can't do, and we do something she can't do. So we have to understand that we have a life to lead that was, it's purposeful, it unfolds, and it unfolds in a particular way, I believe, through our work, through our relationships, through our life with other people, in a particular way, so that we develop into who we were meant to be to the full potential of our lives. So work as I see it, and I call it a vocation, it's the opportunity for us to unfold in a particular way within our relationships with other people. So within our relationships with other people, if we're on the right track, we ought to be developing in a particular way. Our talents are unique, and they would unfold. Our values are unique even if they are universal. They come out in a unique way in us and that would unfold. And our relationships with our community would unfold in a particular way. So that's kind of how you know if you're on the right track. You know. Other people don't always know. You can put on a good show for other people. And I've heard it said that this is back to the creative genius comment. Why we need it today and now I want to launch into the what's possible in my field. I've heard it said that if you're doing business tomorrow like you're doing business today, you'll be out of business. So we need a new and fresh attitude, mentality, perspective, consciousness to keep up with the transformations around us. And what we really are involved in right now is a technological and a global and an economic transformation. It is massive. So let's start with some of these macro changes because that's really the, I think it sets the stage for um, why should we care. Um, according to Lester Thoreau, the uh, MIT e economist, and I think he was the president of MIT for a while, although I might be mistaken. Um, he lists five large trends that he sees around the world, and I'm going to embellish those with some others. Uh, first, the fact that capitalism is spreading all over the globe. Since the decline or demise of communist, uh, the communist bloc in Eastern Europe, we really are seeing capitalism all over the globe. And even if you look at a country like China, which promises to be the dominant power, the dominant power in uh, a short time, uh, what you see is economic liberties, the likes of which we don't see here, and a very authoritarian government. 
but it's not a communistic approach at all it is capitalistic in a big big way um, so the decline of communism and the advance of capitalism is going to hit the entire planet the second major trend has to do with what is uh, marketable in terms of high profitability and for the first time in history Thoreau tells us it is not natural resources like rubber or oil or whatever it is brain power so here's one of my embellishments if you look at the um, economic gains in the United States over the last five years the trend is that 80 percent of the financial profits are going to only 20 percent of the people now this is a staggering statistic. Eighty percent of the of the uh, profits are going to a minority of the individuals. So what it tells us is who are these people? Well, they're individuals who have what this what I'm calling a 21st century mind, and I'm going to spend a lot of time today talking about it. Essentially, it is an entrepreneurial mindset. Whether we're in a corporation or working for ourselves, or retiring, or uh, raising children, there is a kind of thinking that is creative, inventive, improvisational. And that way of thinking seems to be the new mode of thinking. And it's not new, as you see from the study about little children. It is our spontaneous intuitive radical ability to deal with life as it is here and now and many of us have had that laundered out because we've been so eager to fit in to get a job so one of the things I want to speak about in a minute are some new and old rules for success and I think I'm not saying anything new but um, it does seem to be coming together in a rather surprisingly obvious through um, the electronic uh, wavelength, internet and so on, we could be importing intellectual properties and intellectual uh, resources across borders. Now how do you keep track of uh, something like that? So it's very different. Are the, I don't have the answers, I'm just showing you some trends here. The third massive change, and this again is planetary, it's the globe, is the demographic shift. And I alluded to that in my opening remarks. And it's very exciting that the world population is now and will be in the, increasingly in the future dominated by people 65 and over. This is massive ramifications for health care, living arrangements, work, learning, and learning is still considered a lifelong, more, more than ever lifelong. But it does mean something for our colleges. Who is the primary student going to be? It used to be they were, you know, 18 years old. But uh, maybe not. So 65 and older um, around the world is the fastest growing demographic. It was interesting, I looked at the paper, your paper here uh, this morning at the hotel, and in the living section, they have a, a, a section there about the fastest growing uh, retirement communities in your areas. And I think San Ramon is one of the lower, and I think Walnut Creek is one of the higher areas. But, the, but every newspaper now around the country that's worth its weight has at least one segment. Either it's a whole new section or it's a weekly insert, but it's uh, only for people 65 and older. So it is a demographic to be taken seriously. And the fourth, technology. Technology drives the economy in the, in the global economy. It may not in your local setup. I know people that still don't use a computer and they probably won't need to. But, globally speaking, technology will drive. Um, there's a book out now, I think it's called The Placeless Society. And the point of The Placeless Society is that for the first time 
in uh, history. You can make a product anywhere and sell it anywhere else. And you don't even need to have an office. Now I just got on, I just got email and internet and all of that stuff and I'm really enjoying it a lot. And right now it seems like a lot of hype to me because most of it is just junk. It's not very interesting, but you can see what's coming. And my little entrepreneurial mind is just whirling around and I can see all kinds of possibilities uh, later, a couple of years down the line. Uh, and the final uh, trend that uh, Thoreau points out, and I want to speak to it when we talk about new and old rules for success, and that is that diversity will rule. He makes the point that up until now, up until about five years ago, the Anglo-Saxon population has been the majority population. It's been making all the rules and um, sort of setting the agenda. But Thoreau predicts that in the next 10 years or so, there will be no majority population. And what's going to have to happen is that all of the cultures, including third world, are going to have to come together and discuss and plan together how to use resources, how to get along, how to respect each other. And we see that right now. And the only place I would disagree with Thoreau is I think China is going to be a force to be reckoned with before it falls into line as a community, as a neighbor. Uh, we're all neighbors of each other now. Um, new alliances. I want to embellish this point about diversity and then let me move into the new and old rules for success. So all of this is to say, keep asking yourself as I'm talking, well, how, what does this do to the field you want to enter or your field right now? This has huge ramifications. Uh, you know the bumper sticker, think globally, act locally? That's really what we're talking about right here. I'm presenting the global. When you do the journal activity and talk with each other, it'll be the act locally piece of it. It's the only way you can act is within your own context. Um, novel alliances. I think speaking to this amalgam or mix of technology, diversity, anything goes, what we're starting to see is the most creative people are forming novel alliances and it is in every business. So let me give you a few examples and I hope that'll kind of uh, stimulate your brain waves. Uh, we have uh, Steven Spielberg who started out just making films, producing films. He was producing films although his fa family did not want him to when he was just a young boy. And um, he got an eight millimeter camera and that was, that was all they wrote, you know. Well, now he's teaming up with um, all kinds of different companies, production companies, other producers. He's bringing in people that would have in the old days, in the old formatted, uh, format, been competing against him. But now they're all working together. And I guess he's going uh, uh, great guns also in the area of research. So here's another interesting thing, that individuals who are successful in one field are no longer relegated to one field. He's going to continue producing film, but he's also interested in the Holocaust. And he has a huge research project. He has set himself a goal of interviewing every remaining Holocaust survivor around the world. And he does that personally. So he's teamed up with researchers. And that's an odd mix. But there are other odd mixes. For example, last week on uh, the radio I heard or TV, I heard that Motorola and Apple Computer are going to be teamed up. That Motorola is going to start uh, selling uh, within its equipment some Apple technology, whatever it is. Uh, we have national interfaces where when you buy a car and it says Buick, you think that's an American car. But if you open the, the lid or the hood or whatever it's called, the bonnet, <laughs> you find that the parts come from all over the world, all right? And let me give you a personal example. I mentioned the life care centers and this will relate to those people who are in the medical profession who are here. I know we have a lot of nurses and I'm not going to dominate the talk with that. but. Um, we're designing a state-of-the-art Alzheimer Center and it is going to be something very special. 
And so we've been searching for individuals in various fields who have a different take on it, who do not see it as a, um, a blight on the environment where you have to hide all the Alzheimer's people somewhere in some dark cavern someplace. But we're bringing together architects and artists and psychologists who have been looking at Alzheimer's as, as a different state of consciousness and nurses, director of nurses and physicians and even dentists who deal exclusively with uh, people who are in their old age. Um, and we are having sessions together. Now, that shows you what's possible. It's possible to do that now because we've been freed up in some other areas. It's exciting, isn't it? All right, new and old rules, and then let's do a little, then I'll stop talking so much. i put you to work. Um, a couple things here before I move to the new and old rules. I want to make also a point that, you know, we hear a lot about companies terminating people because of downsizing, and that's become very fashionable to talk about. And it's true that in order for a company to be profitable today, not so much colleges where you you dealing with people, but really companies that are production oriented, manufacturing, banking, like that, uh, they have to let people go. Uh, the uh, bullet point on that would be that when AT&T announced at Christmas, I think, a typical, um, that it was going to lay off 40,000 people, the next day the stock rose. So people were buying that stock because they realized that here was a management that was taking care of its primary responsibility to the shareholder. So that's very depressing. However, already there are more people working at home. Uh, I think 20 million plus, plus, plus. No one knows how many people are already working at home. No man, nobody knows how many people are using temp work, part-time work, and um, consulting work as a way not just to augment a salary, but also to stabilize themselves in a brand new field that they're starting at home. So what's good for the goose is good for the gander, as they say. Uh, it, it, things are changing in the corporate workplace, but loyalties have shifted. So for the first time, not only have the loyalties shifted away from the employee from the corporate side, but they've also shifted away from the corporate side by the employee, who is now saying, oh, wait a minute, I can develop expertise in a particular field, and I'll use this job to get to the next level that I want. So it's a little different uh, angle here. All right, new and old rules of success. Um, here again, this was a poll from uh, human resource VPs were polled nationally. What do they look for now when they hire? And uh, they were given some choices. And so the old, they compared the old choices uh, responses some years ago with the new ones. And the old responses had to do with this. What school the person attended, good Ivy League school like that. What grades the graduate had. These are new, new hires. Um, teacher's recommendations. Sorry to you professors. Um, political ties, who they knew, a father, mother, whoever, mostly father, could get the son or the cousin in on a phone call, just like mentoring someone through a fraternity or a sorority. Uh, ability to paint by the numbers. Is this person going to make waves or are they going to fall into line? So that was the biggie. Um, now, new rules, here's what they say. They want thinking skills, the ability to solve problems creatively, good judgment. Uh, one manager says, I don't want to hire somebody that's going to infl inflame our constituents. <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> Apparently. Um, so it's, about, it's not that they don't want technical know-how. That's a given, like I said about my work. It's a given that we have this basic entry level of creative emotional health, but let's move on after that. So above and beyond technical know-how, we want thinking skills. We want independence, they say. And the way an, one of the managers put that was to say, if I have to tell 
a young hire how to do everything, I might as well do it myself. I do not have time. We are really busy today. We've got faxes coming in. They're faster than ever. I have my old fax, which I'm thankful for because it takes a few minutes for the thing to roll out the copy. And in that few minutes, I can be doing, you know, catching my breath or making a call or filling up something else, you know, doing, filling up some fluid some, in some other machine. But you need that time. If it's too instant, it's just overwhelm. I mean, you know, too much. Human skills. Back to the diversity issue of Thoreau. What they want are people to get along with a diverse constituency. Man one manager says, I do not want to hire someone that's going to upset the customer because they don't like that customer. I want people that can talk to each other, get along with their coworkers. Novel relationships. Same thing we were talking about. We want individuals who can get along with various functional units. I don't want just a little nerdy technician who can't talk to people that we're trying to sell our equipment to. I want them to be able to, be able to go in and teach how to use the newest equipment. And we know this. I have bought more than my share of electronic. I am technically, I am technolo uh, tec technically challenged, I think they call it. I want to tell you something, this is so cute. When I was in the airport going someplace, I saw there was a young woman, she must have been 18 or 19, very attractive in the way that uh, only an 18 or 19 year old can be. And she had um, very short hair, uh, cropped. I mean, it was like uh, that, that woman that has white hair, it's short, Susan Power, you know the woman? It was like that, except one side was purple and the other side was green and she had a pin in every orifice in her <laughs> nose and she was all in black so she had some spider painted on her hand she was a work of art and next to her was her traveling companion who was another felt he was a man and he was like about 20 these guys were in 18 or 20 the two of them and he also he had pins everywhere and dark and strange hair but they were cute you know they were you could see they were good kids just enjoying their cosmetics <laughs> and so I heard her say in a most righteous tone to her traveling companion she says and I wrote it down she says I feel so sorry for my parents because they're living below their level of technological capability <laughs> so the next week is when I enrolled in the internet class. <laughs> I thought, you know, from the mouths of babes. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the thing is that I, the point I was going to make originally was when I buy this equipment, then they send somebody to explain it to me and I have no idea what they're talking about. They're so far above my level of technological capability that I have had to go out and hire someone. And of course, I'll never buy equipment from that company again. And so back to the point about when we hire, when we hire people, we want someone that will keep our customers or clients lifelong. Not that they're gonna hop and skip and go like, you know, Jack in the Box one day and Burger King the next. It's not that kind of thing in business. Business is about relationships. Um, and we talked about uh, change, the final point that we want when we're hiring now, say the human resource VPs, is comfort with change. That they, the VPs, do not want to feel uh, guilty every time they go to their workforce and say, we're going to put in new equipment, or we're going to remodel, or we're going to expand. And there was a wonderful article about CEOs and upper management. And the, the, the trend now is for global management. If you want to go into management in a multinational Fortune 500 company, start talking global. Learn a language. You see what I'm saying? There's lots of places where we can grow. So the final point that I want to make as we talk about what's possible in my field is to say how do we put this together 
for offering a service in a place like Pleasant, is Pleasantville? Pleasanton, excuse me. Uh, uh, Pleasantville sounds nice too though. <laughs> um, and I ask myself this when I'm starting my services, when I start a new part of my activity, I think this way. Uh, I read about a secretarial service. Now, nothing new about having a secretarial service except the ones that seem to be doing well and getting attention are the ones where the secretaries put all of the electronics into a minivan and they come to you. Uh, we already have that with dog grooming and taking care of cars. You see how the edge comes in by being a tad bit more creative? So the old model, the old mind is saying, well, you know, if they always served greasy burgers, that's what I'm going to serve. But the new mind is going to take a look at what's happening in the field, what's happening in the world, and say, you know, I seem to see people who are getting older, and they are watching their weight, and they want healthy food. I believe I'm going to serve uh, tofu burgers or whatever. In fact, uh, one of the fastest growing franchises in Washington, I live in Washington State part of the time now, and um, two women, working women, started a business. It was so successful, they now have it as a franchise, and the business was this. These were two individuals that had a family, husband and children, and they asked themselves, what do people need? What can we do? What can we offer? And what they realized was that People needed what they need. Healthy food, fast food, n not too expensive. And that's what they founded their business on. So you can go in and in a matter of minutes get a low fat, delicious fare, whatever, and take it home. I have a neighbor, um, I'm giving you just a few little ideas because then I'm going to put you to work. Uh, I have a neighbor who started a business and sold it, and here's what it was. She's a very domestic person, a very creative person. And she had been, many, for many years, a buyer at Macy's. So she had a lot of um, ingenuity and knew something about setting things up in an attractive way. She found a storefront in San Francisco and created a small takeout, catering and takeout place. And so part of the time, they catered, and part of the time they sold healthy fare, just like I'm describing to you. And then she sold the business. And she sold it for a handsome profit from somebody that didn't have the ingenuity to set it up. And they didn't have the resources either. She had some uh, knowledge of uh, how to put this all together. Another business that I heard about had to do with um, a caller. A caller called me from Palm Springs when I was on a radio talk show. And we were talking just this way, and he said that the most ingenious um, business that he had heard about was a woman that had started the business I'm going to tell you about, and she had it for only one year, and then she sold it for a profit of $15,000. And the business was, this was a woman without a college education, and she was young, I don't know, 18 or 20, something like that. Um, she, would go, she would come to your home with a pooper scooper, and she would clean up after your pets. And that's the business. <laughs> and you know the point that they made. Now this is a little bit off of our, our mark. Our mark is talking about how you create a job that will help you fulfill your destiny. Now, I'm not too sure that this will help you, but as a stepping stone, why not? And the point that he made, and I think it was outstanding, and I want to leave it with you before we start our first interactive activity. He made the following point, that if a person is out of a job and needs a job badly, here's what they have to ask themselves. What is it that other people do not wish to do that I can do for them out of my talents? Isn't that a great question? Because most of us have lots of different things that we can do, but we forget. We can't always do exactly what we want to do. It could be in our sphere of talent, but as we're, as we're climbing our own financial ladder to build that life that we want, 
very often it is necessary to do a couple of different things. So I think that's a good question. It's a very good question for kids to ask themselves when they're just starting out. You know, what is it that I can do that other people don't want to do? And finally, just to say, can I give you a picture of this mind that I'm speaking about? I talked about a mind shift. 21st century mind. I want to keep coming back to that all the time because that really is driving my work. The, con the conviction that there are individuals, whether they have a good education or financial means or not, who have a way of looking at the world that produces solutions. And there are other people who have wonderful qualifications who cannot seem to find their way across the street. <laughs> they need a guide. <laughs> so I see it this way, that the old mind is like, it's more like a concert pianist. Very regimented, needing a score, looking at the conductor. Um, definitely skilled. Skilled is not the issue. But what we're moving towards now is jazz. So the individual, however they play the music for us, they have, we, they have got to have a certain basic level of skill. Skill is not the question, but I don't know that it's that important how they get the skill, because there are jazz pianists who don't read music, but they know music, and they're, they're able to improvise and embellish around the music. Okay, and that gives the audience something fresh and different. And that's sort of the way I see that mind. It's a little different. It moves beyond the score. Doesn't mean it ignores the score. So we're not throwing the baby out. You see where I'm coming from? I'm not saying it's not important to be skilled. I'm saying it's very important to be skilled. We're moving beyond it. I expect people I hire to be skilled. So skilled that I don't have to follow them around. I expect them to have a good work ethic. So good that I can let them go out into the field and talk to my customers and know that the customer's not gonna come back in with a gun and shoot me. Am I exaggerating? No. What is going on with the post office? All right, so we, we expect this. And, and the note I made to myself is that I really don't care where you learned your craft. As long as you are willing to serve my needs, I'm the customer or the hiring person, with those skills. That's pretty much where it's coming from. So we don't have time to run around watching after people that we higher today. The bus is moving, is left, and who's going to be on it are people that can do this jazz that I'm talking about. For us, the consumer, the client, the globe, like that. Okay? So that's a little context about where we are right now. And it is not all black or white. We're moving there. We're not all there. Some communities are slower. Some professions are not quite there. But believe me, it's going quickly. So now I want to give you an assignment, the first assignment. And it goes like this. Now, one thing I will tell you, uh, you don't have to write anything right now. You'll write when you sit down. Uh, my directions are going to be necessarily vague. And the reason they're going to be necessarily vague is because if you don't understand what to do, I want you to punt. And do so in a way that serves your understanding of the material and everybody else. That's really what we're talking about, isn't it? So we want to put into practice a little bit some of the principles that we're speaking about. So if you're not sure, what did she say? What am I to do? How long do we have? Ask somebody or figure it out. Figuring out, by the way, is one of the seven skills of the build your life scenario. So figuring out, we'll use it today in our, and that's wonderful for me because I've never followed a real direction in my life. <laughs> All right. 
I'm just so happy that the 21st century is coming. Uh, just <laughs> I have been out of it for so long. <laughs> so this is called a walkabout. This is called a walkabout, and this gets you to kind of breathe again. Um, and I'm going to give you about 15 minutes, and you'll hear me tell you when to come back. But you're going to do two things. You're going to do a walkabout, which is an activity where you meet new people, and definitely meet new people. And you're going to take turns talking to the people that you meet. And I'd like you to just talk only about what do you see as possible in your field? What's possible in my field? That's the question. Now, if you as a listener hear somebody going down the old negative path, I want you to say, what would happen if, and give them an idea that interjects the, the um, downward spiral into doom. Okay, bring us up. It does two things. First, you're listening from a very uh, focused standpoint, and you're practicing to turn your own listening equipment, your antenna, to the possible. And that's very important right now, to spot options. And for the other, it's important because it'll alert you to the fact that you're heading down stairs when we want you to go upstairs. Um, okay, so that's that first part. The second part, when you come back to your seat, I'd like you to just brainstorm for a minute and just put down ideas. And so may I, before you get up, may I just show you how I would recommend you brainstorm. It'll be kind of a mind map if you are familiar with that. And um, if you have another way, that's fine too. <laughs>